All right, uh, let's do it. So let me just uh, start with a, a couple logistics, right? So um, next Tuesday is the is where we get to watch your lectures, your uh, yeah lecture, I guess, your your videos. So the way that that we do that, I mean, the reason the time budget is super small is because there's a lot of you actually, and there and uh, uh, you know we want to watch as many of them as we possibly can. I've got this room reser reserved from two to four thirty. The way it's going to work is we're going to have you upload your project into a spreadsheet. We'll ask you right there if you want it to be viewed or if your preference is not to be viewed. I would love to watch them all, but if you, if you say you don't want it viewed, then, then we make sure the people that most want to see that have their project viewed and the audience get to get a chance to do that. Uh, and then I actually even have a little script that actually, it, it cuts it off at the time limit. I, I've just learned I have to do that, and it's like, Every once in a while, someone will you know exceed the time limit, and they're just getting to the punchline, and it goes, <laughs> and it's really sad. So, so please, I mean, even if you have to like go afterwards and you know time warp yourself so you're speaking fast, but but it works best uh, for all the logistics to do it on time. Uh, yeah. So you, and then the videos can be public or unlisted. It used to be that I I said if your video is public, then that means it will show it if it's unlisted, but that just that never worked. People always said they're unlisted, but they really wanted to be shown in the last minute. So I'm just going to separately ask, yes or no, do you want to uh, do you want the video to be shown? It's really a lot of fun, like to see what people do, to see what they complain about, you know, to see uh, what worked, what didn't work. I feel like I learn a lot about what's actually working just by watching. I mean, imagine being able to run, you know, 150 parallel experiments, right, and learning. From that, right? So it's really, really, I think, a, a, a great time. So please come. Uh, the last sort of um, little so subject evaluations just came out. I always beg for people to do subject evaluations. I've learned if I assign two points, two points, to the to the to the value of submitting your sub, you know, so you'll just submit on Piazza like a little screenshot saying you did your subject evaluation, two points. But it it. The, the percentages go from like 10% to like 99%. So, so, um, so there's one last little Piazza upload, which is the screenshot of you submitting your subject evaluations. That's posted, uh, if not now, in, within a, a few minutes. But, um, and it, it's because I, I really, it matters. Well, it matters. I mean, MIT looks at it to decide when, how often classes get offered and stuff like that. I'm not as much worried about that. I'm worried about that because I want your feedback, really. I mean, you know I've always been looking at the, at the feedback between classes, and I really want even your high-level feedback like, um, hey, there's a part of manipulation you didn't even talk about, and I, I wish it was there. Or, yeah, there's a part of manipulation you talked about, and I really could have done without that. Or, you know, just, just give me, just tell me how to make the course better, because it really, um, I do try to improve it all the time. Okay, and the last little announcement is um, the, the, there's a talk, the EI seminar right afterwards is the, is the EI seminar about the diffusion policy work. I think it should be good. I'm a little worried that the room will be small, but if, um, if anybody wants to come, I'm going to be running out of here right at 4 to try to go to that. Um, and anybody's welcome to join. It's in the STAR conference room in CISO. Yeah? Any questions about logistics? OK. All right, the last topic I picked to sort of uh, to go through in some technical detail is about um, nominally, it's about tactile sensing, okay, but <clears throat> okay, now the lights are on, good. Um, <clears throat> but I want to combine tactile sensing with soft robot manipulation, okay? And it sounds like those are two ideas that could be nicely separated. But as you'll see, they're actually intimately related. The, if your robot is soft, then that enables you to do a different type of tactile sensing. Okay, So I actually think it's, it's very nice to think about them uh, sort of jointly. OK, so I've, um, I showed a little bit, even when we first started, about when we were talking about all the different variety of dexterous hands. Right, some of the ones that we showed were were soft. Okay, so um, some of them are, are take that to an extreme. They're like under actuated. They're actually even the actuators are soft. There's pneumatic 
sort of, um, you know, valves in here that can open and close. Uh, <coughs> okay, this is another one that can be actually fairly dexterous, right? But these are quite different than the shunk gripper that a lot of us have been using, right? Uh, and they can be surprisingly capable. So this is just to show that it's not just the shadow hand that can do sort of the rearrangement. But you can, that's the, that's the rigid hand. But a soft hand can potentially do some of the, the same sort of things. Okay, uh, around the time that this was happening, I mean, I, I was very impressed by just the general capabilities of, of some of these. But I have to admit, there was one of them in particular that I was just like, oh, that looks so good. That, that actually kind of looks right to me. And, um, and it, it was this one, okay? So this is um, from Disney. I mean, Disney's good at, at making things look beautiful and, and compelling, right? Um, and it's just, it's a very simple demo in some sense, okay? And it's, uh, you know, it's, the controller was, was incredibly simple, but there was something about the way this thing was interacting with simple objects that I felt like, oh, that is, that is what I want in a sort of soft robot. That's kind of why I could, I could see us sort of using soft robots. That was around, that was a little bit after um, Disney came out with Winnie the Pooh. It was never officially connected to Winnie the Pooh, but you know, come on, right? It doesn't take too much imagination to, to think they were making some little Winnie the Poohs, right? Um, and that group uh, went on to, to build things that had, I mean, that was, first it was kind of just bubble end effectors, right? But then you can imagine taking that same sort of technology and putting it into a hand, okay? They had pressure sensing in each of those air bags, right? So they had some amount of, of, of sensing, but the, I think the focus there was really on the compliant interaction with the objects. Uh, the, the lead author on that, Alex, we actually recruited him to, to TRI. He's, he's uh, continued on. He actually organizes at um, Humanoids each year this Can We Build Baymax. Uh, he's one of the co-organizers for this, which is actually an awesome. It's coming up uh, very soon. And they have this sort of just awesome list of speakers about all the, all the people that are doing uh, cutting edge humanoids, okay? But it's this, this annual workshop where they talk about, uh, you know, can we build can we build Baymax? And that's kind of the dream, right? Is um, uh, Alex is leading this Project Puno, we call it, in, uh, at TRI, which this is a, one of the Toyota robots, humanoid robots that existed before. This is the Baymax art, and the hope is to sort of put them together. And Puno, I guess some of you might know, I guess it means um, sort of cuddly and cute in Japanese. Uh, so that was our... Uh, a replacement for the word Baymax, which is copyrighted, um, <laughs> right? And uh, so, so the artwork that we use to sort of inspire ourselves looks kind of like this. This is what we want Puno. In fact, you might have even noticed it's on my, uh, the back of my laptop all year, right? Okay, so um, when people talk about soft robots, they instantly list a bunch of great reasons why you would, might want to be soft, okay? For instance, they'll say um, soft means you're inherently safe, right? It's work, safe to work around people if you're, if you're soft, right? They'll say um, that you're robust to geometric uncertainty. If you don't know the shape of your objects, then being soft really helps. Another big one is that you're, you're durable, maybe, you know, and or low cost, right? I really think that the fabrication techniques that have been coming online, you know, being able to 3D print soft materials and things like this, it's, it's going to change the way we build robots. There's almost no question. Hopefully drive the cost down a lot, right? Um, maybe make things more durable. There's, it's not hard to find a soft robot video where uh, someone like drives the car over the robot and then it gets up and walks away or something like this. These are the some of the purported advantages, right? So 
I, but it's a little easy to say these, and I want to just think critically about, I mean, this one I sort of, uh, that's just a materials question. I won't talk about that. You know, I think, but I, I think there's, there's a chance that could be a real, a real good reason. These two, I think, are a little bit more subtle, and, uh, and I want to think about them critically with you. And I, for me, it hel it's helpful to think about sort of the simple example of that. Okay, so um, here's what I kind of want to use as a, as a working example. So imagine I have my manipuland, the thing I'm going to manipulate, right? And just to forget about contact or whatever, I'll just say it's like frictionless here or something, okay? And I'm going to similarly, I'm going to replace my hand with another little thing that's just kind of a one degree of freedom uh, version of manipulation, okay? There, I've got a bimanual <laughs> manipulator in the plane, okay? <clears throat> and really, um, even to make it more simple, let me, let me make a point finger here, okay? And another one on this hand. And I want to compare that with the alternative, maybe. This would, I would call this rigid manipulation. And I think to first order, the thing that happens when you're soft is that you get a similar diagram. Okay, but between your hand and the objects, you're going to have a, a spring here, right? Maybe a spring and a damper. This would be kind of a dash pot, so this would be a spring and a damper. Okay, but otherwise, I want the picture to be the same. Okay, this is my soft manipulator. And even though that's a dramatic oversimplification of what's happened, it's actually, I think, a pretty good exercise to just think through what does that do to change the manipulation problem. Okay, so let's just start with um, the moment of impact. How are these two different at the moment of impact? Maybe that's the safety case question. Okay. Um, on the rigid case, you get at the moment of impact, you get a, an impulsive collision. Okay. where the relative velocities of, of the hand and the manipulant must go to zero if it's, in, if it's a plastic collision, or it could bounce back if you're elastic, okay? But at least it can't be, you can't penetrate the object. So your whatever velocity, whatever relative velocity you had between these two, at the moment of collision, all of that velocity is drawn out of the system, and you have an impact, right? It's an impulsive collision. In the soft case, in the limit where, let's just say I have the mass of the hand and the mass of the finger here, okay? If the mass of the finger equals zero, which is maybe the extreme case, okay, then there's actually no impulse. Right? No impulsive collision. Of course, we don't have massless fingers, but if you have a soft skin, and this is the mass of your skin, and this is the mass of your hand, then actually that's not so far from having a massless finger. Right? So in the limit of a very soft, very light skin, okay, then actually you have removed the 
the impulsive collision from the system. Okay, what about during contact? Okay, if I was rigid, then I could be doing force control, right? Or maybe stiffness control, impedance control, right? Something in, in that lineage, right? And actually, assuming that I have high enough rate control of my motors, I can make my system, if, from the stiffness control's perspective, right? If I have high enough uh, bandwidth on my actuators here, then I can act like this system. That was our lesson from stiffness control, right? So, so that's cool. Okay. Now the question is, if you have a, a spring here and you have a good controller here, then you think, all right, I could definitely also act, I, could I should be able to make this system act stiffer, right? And you can, but there's limits to what you can do there. At some point, your bandwidth becomes limited by the physical spring that's in the system. You've reduced the bandwidth capabilities of your robot. So you can, you can try to move very quickly to act like a slightly stiffer spring, but you're not going to get too far with that. So in that view, like when you're in contact, in some sense, the rigid is better, right? You can always act soft with a good enough controller, but it's hard to act stiffer. You know, the, the, the details are in the numbers, you know, and, and bandwidth of your motors and stuff like that, but that's, I think, a pretty good summary of what happens, okay? <clears throat> so from that perspective, you'd say rigid is only better. In fact, I remember having, uh, you know, really good discussions when we started working a little bit more on soft robots in my group even. There were a few people who were like, why would you want to be soft? You, if you, you should always be rigid and have just, just make your motors faster. Like, it, there's no reason to be soft. You, can, you would rather be, simulate softness than put a physical spring between your control authority and the world. That's only a bottleneck, right? Now, the impulse, if I think of that as instantaneous, then I'm, I've kind of tacitly assumed here that this, you, you can't do control inside the impulse. It happens too fast for you to respond to, so you're not going to like deaden the impulse that's an instantaneous event in the, in the limit. All right, so, um, so inherently safe, right? So I do think that at the moment of impact, having a super light mass make the initial thing and a soft spring re reduces the, the impact, okay? But it's fairly subtle, because apart from that initial contact, the rigid object, the rigid actuator could potentially act just as, just as well as this other one, right? If there's robustness to geometric uncertainty, I don't know, force control, we already talked about giving robustness to geometric uncertainty. It's not clear that you need to change, you know, put a spring in there. That it doesn't really, in my mind, it doesn't affect my ability to be robust to geometric uncertainty. I just need a controller to make that happen. Okay? So it's subtle. But that's not the whole story, okay? This picture is impoverished in, a, I think, a critical way. And I actually do think there is robustness to geometric uncertainty by being soft. But it's, again, it's subtle. It doesn't come from that picture. We have to expand our picture to see it. Any questions about that so far?
OK, so let's update our picture. And this is going to test my artist, uh, artistic abilities here. OK, let's say I've got a non, um, you, uh, you know, this is still my manipulant, but now it's curvy, OK? Well, maybe just to say one more thing about, about this. Um, this doesn't exist in reality. Right? There's always some, like every material has an elastic modulus. Okay. So really, <clears throat> um, the question is just how stiff is your spring? Right? Do you put a pocket of air between you and the world? A pocket of, you know, a, 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 an actual mechanical spring? Or are you using the elastic modulus of steel or something, right? Um, you know, but it's always, there's always a little bit of deformation. So really what I want to say is that soft robots are the case where this picture is, is good and the stiffness of the spring is relatively low, sort of comp in the dimensionless, anal you know, in, in somehow relative to the masses in the system, okay? So, and, the, and the bandwidth of the system and other things. So that spring constant is sort of, in a dimensionless way, low relative to the dynamics. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, I think you're. I think you're right that it's that there's a time constant based on the relationship of the mass and the stiffness. Yeah. Um, but I think you know. I think uh, being softer here drives down your bandwidth limitation. Right. There's a monotonic relationship between your total bandwidth and the spring. But you're right to compute it rigorously. We need the, we need all the, we need to take it uh, dimensionlessly. Yeah. Good. Okay, so now I've got my sort of weird, you might see like, a, I don't know, an old woman and a young woman or something like that in that. I don't know. That's a really bad drawing. Okay, but um, and now my hand is going to be a little bit more interesting, I guess. Still a box here. OK, and now I want to think about sort of the extension of that picture, but when I have a skin, a full, a full skin. I'm not touching just at a point. I'm touching sort of, I have, let's say, I won't draw the dash, dash pot, OK, but. Imagine a finite approximation of a continuous skin. Okay, you see what I'm going for here? Okay, so now there's an interesting question. When I have a particular stiffness in the, in the spring, and I push with a gripper strength, what happens, right? If I'm in the stiff case, the stiff spring, then maybe as soon as I make the first contact, so hydroelastic contacts are red in Drake, right? So let's say I, I get, my, maybe I'll get contacts here at this, like the first point of contact. So I push this in, this point sort of makes contact. And then because it's a stiff, spring, these will not reach the surface and will not make contact. Okay. If, however, the springs are soft, then you could imagine getting yourself into a situation where you've got like lots of contact points, where you've got a heavily deflected spring here, right? But in the very soft case, and you push in, and you can make contact all up and down. This, I think, can dramatically change the dynamics of contact. And in my book, this is the fundamental reason to be soft, because it changes the, the geometry, OK, and the mechanics of contact, not in the direction of contact, actually, but in this other direction, by going from point contacts in the, in the extreme limit, to surface patchy contacts, OK? And why does that matter, right? So now, if I have friction cones, you know, that are, well, first of all, not only are, they, are there more friction cones, but maybe they're even 
since they're normal to the surface, maybe they're pointing in different directions. Okay, so for instance, if I want to pick this object up, right? I, I'm grabbing from both sides, I'm just gonna save myself a little bad art. Um, so I've got mg pulling me down, I need to bring mg pull me up, right? If I have, if I'm only making contact at the top, I have a friction cone at the normal of that top, and I might have to squeeze quite a bit in order to achieve in the normal direction a frictional force that can counter gravity and lift the object up. Okay, if I have lots of contact points, then first of all, I still need to somehow counter gravity, but I could potentially do that by distributing the normal forces across lots of points on the object. So that might be better for the object, right? So for instance, if a classic thing would be trying to pick up an egg, right? Maybe you don't want to be a uh, steel point uh, robot when you're picking up an egg. It's better to go and kind of put your pressure, distribute your pressure across the entire shell of the egg, right? Um, <clears throat> but you also might benefit from having some normals that are kind of, I don't know, some, some surface normals that are already pointing up, right? This one is sort of inherently tilted this way in my limited artistic ability, right? So just by having the friction cones tilted all over the place, I can achieve a lifting force with less normal force. Okay, now if I squeeze both of these, I could use force control, I can use stiffness control, or whatever, okay, but in this case, um, without knowing the geometry of the object, you know, I'm more likely in the soft case to comply to the object and get this nice surface patch. patch. So the, in my mind, I, I agree that there's a robustness to geometric uncertainty. But again, it's not in this picture, it's only from that picture. There's some other subtle things that come in that maybe you can already see from this picture. The inherently safe is actually, I, I think people say that pretty quickly, um, and, and it's, a little it's a little careful. You gotta be a little careful, right? So if you do have a physical spring in your system, then you can store energy in your system, right? So you can compress this, compress this, compress this with contact, and then remove contact, and it's gonna spring back at you, right? So people talk about, the safety of pneumatics, for instance, as being, pneumatics can be potentially a little unsafe because you can store a lot of energy in a, in a, in a compressed spring, right? Now, you know, it seems hard to believe that Baymax would smack you and hurt you, um, but I think that's gonna be at the, at the level of having a very soft skin at the interface. I think just having a light spring isn't enough. Maybe there's one other thing we can sort of see in these simple pictures. Uh, imagine I have, um, let's just think about, if I have the manipulant here. I'll just draw half of the diagram. I've got my point finger, I have my hand, and then I have, let's say, my wrist. So I'm gonna add a few more degrees of freedom for the robot arm as I go up, okay. And there's some inherent stiffness in my mechanism between my hand and my skin, if you will. Um, maybe I've got a, like we think of <clears throat> the Iwa as an elastic robot, elastic joint robot, right? So it's got um, springs, actually, stiff springs, very stiff springs, but springs in its joints. So I guess there's a question that you can sort of see here is, is it better to have springs in your, is it just as good to have springs in your joints or must you have the springs at your skin? Okay. If this is large, but your joints are small, then you can, again, you can try to, you can act soft, okay, but this is like having a heavy finger, right? So the, 
if you if your joint sensing joint control is is back up your arm relative to the actual contact then you'll have an initial impact that'll be larger or it'll take so there'll be some some mass between your high bandwidth control and the the thing that's contacting the world okay so there's a preference i think of putting your joint sensing your joint control your you know as close as possible to the actual interaction and that's one of the reasons to prefer to like tactile control. Right? So KUKA joint sensing gets you somewhere, but having a force sensor exactly at the point of interaction, you, you just can't beat it, Some, as long as it's as high accuracy. Sometimes you can put a better sensor here than you can put here, okay, and then it gets more subtle. But if you had equally good sensors, I would put it as close as possible. Don't put any mass between your sensor and the, and the interaction. That makes sense? Okay. So that, so let's talk about the sensing aspect of it. Okay, so let's, um, what, what kind of tactile sensing can I do? People have thought about tactile sensors for a long time. Um, and they've come in a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes and variety, okay? So, um, and maybe you'd categorize them based on what kind of information they bring, they give, they're, they're able to report. And there's actually a lot of things that could be useful uh, to get out of a tactile sensor. So the simplest ones, would just be, give binary contact, no contact, right? That seems awfully impoverished given what we just talked about, okay, but it's, it, it's the simplest thing to instrument. Uh, you could ask for force sensing. And, and actually a lot of force sensing contact sensors will give the normal force. Many fewer of them will actually give the tangential force, the shear force. Right, so it's actually, it's kind of easy to put a, a force sensitive element between you and the, and the world in one direction, but if you want that to be able to, if you want to be able to pull, you know, get the friction kind of forces, there's less of the sensors are able to, to give you that information. That would be a shear force or normal or a tangential force. But you should, I mean, people have thought very creatively about all the different sort of information available at, that could be available at the skin. So actually temperature, electro, you know, like the, how, how, uh, how conductive is the material you're touching is actually a pretty good way to tell if you're touching wood or metal or something like this, right? Um, there's a lot of different sort of things that were that are not about the the mechanics of manipulation so much, but they could be very informative about the thing you're touching. Um, people think about trying to sense texture, roughness. Let's say. I remember an application where um, Robonaut the humanoid that that's on the, was on the space station was trying to like um, slide its fingers along uh, some space mat and try to find uh, find the grommets because it needed to like you know put something through the grommet right so so it's like sliding its finger one of the early successes of fingertip sensing was like sliding its finger along finding the grommet and then more reliably doing manipulation of the grommet <coughs> The human sense, the human sense of touch is fantastic and uh, has all kinds of different cells and, inside it and stuff. Some of them are sensitive to vibration, right? Um, so a lot of the times we might actually get roughness from vibration sensing. People sometimes talk about sticking a microphone in your finger, in your robot finger, right? Just to pick up the high frequency as you slide something around. So this was kind of the list that I, I had in my head 
a handful of years ago. But it changed um, because <coughs> once we started building these softer robots, and Ted, for instance, Ted Adelson, came by and said, why don't you put a camera behind your soft skin? Okay. Then there was a sort of a new information that became possible. Wouldn't it be nice if you could sort of measure, the, in my, my simple picture, like measure the displacement of all those contact points? And in the limit, maybe you have a very dense reconstruction of the geometry of the contact patch. I was, when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, that's cool. Like, you could have cameras, but, but force is the thing we want. Like, if we're going to do control, we want force, right? But he convinced me. I mean, like, I, I, the, and the more we've worked with them, the more I came around to it. Like, so imagine I'm, I'm buttoning my shirt, right? You know, it's one of my favorite examples. What, what information does my finger need to convey to my brain about the button on my shirt? It's not really how hard I'm pushing on the button. But the orientation of that button and whether I'm lined up with the little, you know, slot, that is mostly about the geometry of the button relative to my finger, right? So you can come up with a lot of useful examples where probably the primary signal that you want is actually more about geometry and less about force. I guess I had just never thought we'd get dense geometry out of a sensor, but Ted introduced these very successful line of of sensors um, that are based on on exactly that. Okay, so um, Gelsight is the is the brand name. Okay, and they started off with simple, relatively simple demonstrations. Okay, um, Oreo cookie pushed on uh, a squishy substance. Importantly, with the surface painted with something opaque, so that you're if you have a camera inside your finger, you don't see the world. The world's confusing. Okay, you just see the geometry of the things that pushed on your on your sensor, okay. and then you suddenly get with uh, the first version of gel site was using photogrammetry, so it was, had a red, green, and uh, actually yellow, red, and green. I forget three three you know colors that would then uh, allow you to with a single camera do three D reconstruction, like a classic technique from computer vision that found a new home again inside the fingertip of, of these things. And the, <coughs> the initial results were just already like super compelling. So you got this very simple looking sensor. Okay, you can see all kinds of things on the other side. That's you being inside the finger, if you will, okay. But <coughs> the, the resolution that was possible uh, was sort of like immediately uh, impressive, right? They, it didn't take like many generations because because we have these high density uh, cameras, right? H high resolution images on the cameras. You can see fingertip patterns. Right. Imagine a camera in your finger that could see all that stuff, right? Actually, Ted had, um, it took a little while for this to catch on in robotics. He would come to me, he'd be like, I have all this information and nobody knows what to do with it. So nobody wants the sensors. They're like, yeah, that sounds cool, but I don't even know how to use it. I don't know how to process that information. You're like giving me something I don't know how to deal with, right? So it took a while for it to catch on. My favorite one is, here we go, like the dollar bill. To be able to see the writing on a dollar bill, how awesome is that, right? I mean, come on, that's like pretty good. That's definitely superhuman uh, resolution. Okay, so that led to a line of work. Um, well, let me just say, good. All right, so yeah, so Ted's initial struggle was uh, was what do people people didn't know? Oh yeah, please go ahead. So, you, so okay, um, this is about, I, I said it's about geometry sensing, but maybe what you're getting to is I, um, if you know the stiffness of your gel, 
then you, can, you have a sense from just the depth of force also, okay? More subtle is, um, if you, that's normal force, let's say. If you want to get shear force, then what you really want to measure is like how much the surface of your gel has been dragged around. And what people have, with, with Ted initially and other people have done is they, they'll like put a pattern of dots, let's say, on the surface of the gel, and then you can watch, you can track the dots moving around, and that'll give you a shear force a relatively dense shear force, like a vector field on the surface of the object. Yeah? It's pretty cool. Okay, so like, how do you, I mean, we've talked about a lot of different computational ideas in the class, right? How do you deal with that information, right? Um, the simplest idea, actually, is just uh, when we first got it, the first thing we did, we took our, basically our pose estimation geometric perception chapter and we said, basically, someone gave me another point cloud sensor. It just happens to be in my, inside my finger, and its maximum range is the skin, okay? But if I have a model of the, of the thing I'm trying to pick up, I'm basically, I could do ICP, right? I can do tracking. And <clears throat> we started showing uh, relatively simple examples of tracking with point clouds from vision, you know, the head-mounted sensor, but also the, the gel site sensor for touch, right? Because the thing is, uh, you're tracking an object with your head-mounted camera, uh, but then as soon as you want to do the, like as soon as you get close to manipulating, your hand occludes the camera. So this fills in that gap. Like the moment, the, the most important part of the, of the thing that was previously occluded becomes visible just at that, um, at that moment of, of contact. And the, the resolution here, of course, when you're close in and you're feeling the object is like far better than what you could get with your head mounted distant camera, right? So this was just an example of like a, a high resolution task that with, that with a head mounted camera you had no chance, but with a, with a gel site you could. All right, so number one takeaway, most of our robotic tools work, you just have to think about your finger as a camera, as another camera. And the gel, gel site let us think about it as a depth sensor. Okay, so there's been lots more work. So this is um, Francois Hogan in Alberto's group um, was using, they made a version of this called Gel Slim, right? So Gel Sight was um, kind of just a box and it had a, the camera had to be away from the box. So uh, it was hard to make a slim version of the sensor, but they made a, they, they did that with mirrors and the like, and uh, they put this into a more full manipulation pipeline where the estimation of the object was, in, was aided not, not only by the around surrounding cameras, but also by the, um, and mostly by the, the sensing in the, in the hand, right? And feedback control using those sensors, just like really nice work. So one of the interesting, you can see the dot patterns there, which is for the shear force, right? One of the interesting things was like, uh, some of the, the moves Francois was doing, he would like, have the box kind of on its corner. It's not so different than the, the box flip up we talked about before. And there's a force in the hand. And there's, um, you would like to be able to like detect slip, right? Maybe if the corner of the box starts slipping, you'd think you'd want to make a feedback controller that could react to that slip and recover. Uh, that's actually really hard, so, right? Like basically what Francois said was, once you've detected slip, it's too late. You know, like it's just like it slipped and then it's gone, right? You, you see it, but there's not enough time to react. It's kind of, it's almost an impulse, right? So people talk about incipient slip, like incipient slip, which is trying to detect just the moment before it slips, but it's very, it's very hard to, to do feedback inside of, of the slipping dynamics. Okay, here's the um, TRI's version of it, the sort of Puno version of it. Uh, is these, we made a, a much bigger, so, so the initial gel site had, um, had I'd say robustness issues maybe, <laughs> and it also had issues about, um, it was confined to this little box, so a lot of times if you'd reach into um, a space, the thing that would bump first would be the mounting of your gel site and not the actual gel site. So at that time, we are like, we don't wanna deal with the hardware so much, we wanna get to the computational issues of well, what does it mean to have a tactile sensor, so we built a big, robust, soft bubble gripper. And we've been doing a lot of work over the years of thinking about the, the computational advantages and disadvantages of having that, right? This one's uh, 
one of our favorites was to be able to stack wine glasses. That was back at the time where external depth cameras couldn't see clear objects. You know, you, so that was a sort of a fun thing there. So you could sense the gripping. I brought that one here. Uh, I had to disconnect the air hoses, so it's a looking a little sad. It actually reminds me of uh, this moment. Remember this? Yeah, that's what I felt like when I brought this over. I was like, oh, this poor guy. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the movie. OK. <laughs> um, OK, but things have been getting better fast. I think this is one design. and. Um, there was a lot of, we've done a lot of experiments around this. So um, one question you might ask is, like I said, it's the closer you have to putting your force sensor um, directly at your point of contact, the better. And so one of the questions we asked is, could you do like impedance control using the soft bubble gripper as a six axis force torque sensor exactly at the point of contact? So we had to calibrate the stiffness of the bubble, which was air pressure dependent, right? Um, and the, in all six axes, we would try to estimate the, the current um, force and then and torque and, uh, and then write a st an impedance controller around that. And it seemed, our conclusion was that it's sufficient with a little bit of calibration to write an impedance controller right at the point of contact. And the benefits of that, again, versus your, joint, your distal joint sensing is that uh, you're right there and you can, you can do better, yeah? You're saying if you were to, um, I mean, we, we tried to write all the algorithms so that no matter where it landed in the finger, we were pretty robust to the estimation. Is that what you're worried about? Is the, or you're saying that the, I see in the, in the horizontal direction, you're worried about, because you don't have a perfect model of the geometry, so you don't know the moment of contact. Yep. Yep. Agreed. Yep. So in that sense, I think the for the horizontal precision, we are trying to be in this mode. So basically, uh, if the if the first contact was was super significant to, to the task, then we might be in trouble. But you know, we can know exactly where the object is once we've made contact because we have exactly measurements local exactly where we want them in order to know where it. And similar, actually, similarly in the other directions, right? So the philosophy is. You know, use your existing cameras to get a close, but then once you squeeze, you have very good information about the relative pose of the object in your hand, like better than we ever had before. But I agree that there could be uncertain, you know, um, messiness in the actual creation of contact. Mm -hmm. The other way we've so I so you can use these sensors directly in a sort of a point cloud pipeline. But I also showed you this, these things appeared when I was talking about the diffusion policy work, right? And uh, we've seen that our learning pipelines, although there's no explicit reconstruction of the depth, uh, well, sorry, this one has a depth camera in, in its fingers, so there is a explicit, but um, there's no uh, explicit pose estimation of the plate or anything like this, but the learning pipelines can treat that, the camera in the hand as one more source of information that you condition the diffusion policy on in this case. And for tasks that were very sensitive, like sliding that plate off the edge, it was markedly better to have a tactile sensor than to not have a tactile sensor. Right, so we've seen their computational advantages in both cases, the learning and the sort of classical pipeline. This is another example that we think would have been very hard to do without tactile sensing. That initial grasp, fine, but then even putting this on, right, to be able to sort of wiggle it until you know that you had contact, and then <clears throat> not only does it turn in order to, to do that, that would be fine, but it actually knows that it's done turning based on the forces between the finger and the bottle cap, and it'll stop when it's done.
Okay, and this is a field that's going to be moving fast. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of good work happening here. This is a, a work by Stanford that has um, now, you know, gel site like uh, sensors that are more like the size of a fingertip, a beautiful calibration rig that allows them to, to train a deep learning um, system to take the single camera image and extract depth from a known, imagine basically this thing is a, can make arbitrary shapes and then it, it, they would imp impress an arbitrary shape in there and use that as to make training data to train a network to then reconstruct depth with a, a simpler camera setup. So this stuff's gonna move fast and I think this new world of, they, they call it visual tactile sensing. Cameras in your fingers is, I think, I'm pretty dominant right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an excellent example, just to say it back for the, uh, the microphone. But yeah, so imagine uh, in a factory, then maybe um, if the safety case is not about the contact with the object, but the, whether the object slips out of the hand, then that becomes a very subtle argument about whether this is actually inherently safe. If you're a soft robot carrying a lead pipe, you know, then, then uh, you're just danger as dangerous again, right? So um, I don't know that it's more dangerous, right? Because I think you have exquisite contact uh, force resolution. Maybe you can detect slip, but Hopefully not when it's too late, okay? Um, but I, it, it's a good example of how subtle the safety case is. So I think saying out of the box inherently safe is a, is a harder argument. Yeah? It could be, yeah, the, the, the decreased bandwidth could be get in the way of safety. Yeah, I think it's a subtle case. Good, good. Uh, this is, I think, one of the latest and greatest is uh, this gel site spelt which Alan very nicely let me borrow here. Um, it actually, he's got a beautiful setup where you can like see the output, but maybe I'll just show it for now, but it's this really nice little, um, nice, nice packaging of now, imagine this gel site technology, okay, right here, when you can actually watch the videos underneath, but the, you know, using mirrors, the light path is pulled away from the, from the actual surface, so you don't have to have a camera sticking back and have the depth a field of view of the camera sort of constraining the shape of your fingers. And these are nice, uh, smooth, slim, if you will, svelte um, fingers. Right, and they get, you get depth images like this, which might be annoying to deal with, I guess, if in the, in the original world of trying to do all the, everything with geometry, but if you're training a deep learning system to take those RGB images and, and bring back Yep, uh, you know, rectified geometry, then I think those differences are not as great. Cool. Okay, so that was a lot about fingertips or like the contact between it. Um, there's a lot, of, I mean, and there's, uh, that was a, a very quick, you know, a few examples of a, of a big literature that people have been building tactile sensors. Okay, but um, it's also interesting to ask about the rest of the body, right? And there's, a, there's less, much less work, I would say, but still lots of still good work about whole body sensing, right? One of the initial ones, I would say one of the most impressive, yeah, 2012 sort of um, early super impressive demonstrations was this iCub from IIT. They built massive uh, sensing arrays, and even just the wiring of this thing uh, was super impressive. Let me just highlight the... Okay, so, so this, each one of these is a, is a force sensor, okay? And they're wired through a, you know, a network uh, that goes across this entire um, cell. We actually worked with them, we collaborated them with a, a bit to make one for the IWA, okay? And the, just the patterning of this electronics all over the skin. This was a relatively rigid, it almost made IWA look like the evil Spider-Man or something. 
um, but it had like contact sensing densely, relatively densely over the entire, entire body. Okay, so there've been some amazing projects like that. Um, uh, at TRI, we've built like so many different force sensing. So actually the chest of, of Punyo, uh, we've had a few different versions of it. We have some you know, uh, array sort of based contact sensing. But we also had a, a, an intern, Jessica Yin, who did this awesome project where she, she had a concept of basically having a, a multiple modalities of sensing inside the chest. Some of them using different basically spectrum and a, and a material that had proper, uh, the proper sort of lighting properties. Uh, one sensor could see through the chest and could see objects as they were coming to have proximity sensing. The other sensor would see that only the deflection of the chest. So you had both like the gel site, but you could also see through. And then you could actually uh, estimate the geometry of the contact patch by taking a diff between those two roughly. Okay, so there's just so many clever um, sensing designs. This is uh, just a teaser of some of the work we're doing on a Cunho prototype where we have sensing all up and down the arm. We're combining that, you see the soft bubble sensors and uh, training diffusion policy kind of skills. I should have shown the rollout instead of the demonstration, but you can, you can see the, the capabilities there. So um, the Puno team talks a lot about how limiting it is to touch the world only with your, thing, with your hands, right? Not only, first of all, for incidental contact, right? Like if you, if you bump into something and you, you have no sensing to detect that you've bumped into something, that's a pretty bad place to be. Uh, there's been work showing that um, trying to estimate, even from joint torque sensing, where you bumped, if you, if you could detect that you bumped by seeing your torque, your external torque being different than your expected torque. But estimating where on the world you bumped just with joint torque sensing is extremely difficult. Um, it's, it's just uh, an ill-posed problem. There's, you can produce the same torques by pushing it many places on the, on the robot body, especially if it could happen, if it'd be contacting in many points. Okay, so, but also for like whole body manipulation, I think robots actually are paying a price by only in manipulating objects with their hand. I mean, you see, you have like a max payload of your arm because they're, they're talking about only contacting here. If you were to distribute the load across your entire arm, then actually you can lift heavier objects. You can manipulate sort of big, uh, awkward things. And humans do it all the time. We don't just touch the world with our fingertips and do collision-free motion planning everywhere else. Right? I hate, I, that's, what I, that's the one thing I don't like about collision-free motion planning is that we shouldn't be so afraid of contact. It's just because we have big metal Iwa and a little bit of rubber at the fingertips and maybe or maybe not contact sensing. We, once we get robot skins, I think the equations will change dramatically. And then there's all kinds of cool projects now. This one is from uh, CCEL also, okay, but <coughs> of trying to like weave tactile sensing, you know, force sensing into let's say a glove. This would be awesome for instance for getting demonstrations uh, for behavior cloning for instance, or learning, somehow learning models of the world. I should have put this earlier, but all of these, I think, pale compared to what's happening in your fingertip, right? There's just a very rich uh, understanding and, and just uh, capability in all of the different types of sensing modalities that you have stacked in a small layer of skin. And there was a time where I could have told you every cell and what it does and what it's sort of, what it was receptive to, uh, but that time has passed. I'm sorry, I, 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 it's been too many years. Cool, okay, so that's a bit about contact tactile sensing. Let me just say a few words about simulation of this stuff, right? So everybody asks, well, can you simulate your bubble sensor? Yeah, we can simulate the bubble sensor, right? Um, but it took work. So um, there's a lot of good work in the world of soft body simulation. There's actually relatively much less work on um, combining rigid body simulation with, tact with the flexible body simulation. That's often a pain point. Sometimes you'll see, if you see like um, NVIDIA Flex particle-based simulation, 
and then there's a robot in it. The robot is actually made of a bunch of particles that are rigidly welded together, but that's like a super inefficient, bad for modeling kind of way. <coughs> so we've done a lot of work, not only writing a nice finite element model for, for simulation, but also thinking about the way to couple that um, correctly with the rigid body solvers. And uh, you know, this is like the soft bubble, picking up a soft teddy bear, and shaking it violently, I think, you know, but uh, Okay, so we can definitely, and that, so that required not only interacting between the soft finite element, but also welding that to the rigid uh, mechanics of the hand. Okay, and um, <coughs> it's interesting, there's, there, there's just like in rigid bodies, but even more so I'd say in, in soft body, um, there's a lot of simulators out there that are sort of game engine quality, where the goal has been to run fast, but the, um, you know, Basically, you get a lot of possible contact pairs, a lot of equations that you want to solve. And in order to run fast and just be visually compelling, then what you do is you either don't solve the convergence or you pick a handful of those equations to satisfy and just and say that's good enough, right? And maybe stubbornly uh, in Drake, we've been saying, no, you should solve, you should write down all of the equations, you should solve them to convergence, and then go to the next time step. And that made us slower in the beginning but closer to, to reality. Uh, but now these guys figured out uh, a very fast, a convex solve that, that, that solves these soft body problems extremely fast, all the way to convergence. So hopefully we'll get the best of both worlds. Now what we need to do is make it easier for you to just drop your OBJs in and make it work. That's the last piece of the puzzle. But actually, all, in Drake right now is all these capabilities. It's just, we just gotta make it easier to drop your models in. And this is the, so there's multiple ways you could simulate a bubble sensor. The, one of them would be to actually just use a rigid body model of the, uh, of the bubble, use their soft contact and allow the objects to penetrate a bit, but the geometry of the surface doesn't change. And you just put a depth camera behind the bubble and you can see what's stuck through. But this is a richer contact simulation, which allows you to think about even stretch and, and other things, which is the full finite element model of the, of the skin interacting with rigid objects, you put your camera underneath, and you can see what's happening, just like you would in the real sensor. Pretty sure this one torques also. Maybe not. Okay. Any questions about that before I sort of just, I always try to wrap up the course and sort of say all the things we said so you have some takeaway messages, but any questions about tactile sensing or soft skin? Yeah, you can ask. Yeah. Yep, yep, so um, basically we try, to, um, we try to work on things that are gonna run at least at real time, right? We're not in the 10,000 times real time on the GPU, um, I think we can get faster as we go. So all, almost all of those simulations are started slower than real time. We get to real time before we consider them sort of ready for prime time. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, I mean, at some point you actually pay a bigger cost from the rendering, <laughs> depending on how parallelized your rendering is. Uh, but if you put cameras everywhere, that'll slow down the simulation actually as much as the finite element. The, the, the finite element code is actually really performant, uh, more than I expected. But it's fresh, it will get better and better, yeah? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I mean, there's been there's been a lot of work over the years of trying to make um, artificial muscles, right? So people um, have, have made McKibben muscles and, and things like this um, as actuators, and there's various arguments for it. Uh, I would say in most cases, 
maybe this is my bias, but I would say in most cases I would prefer an electric motor and try to use the high bandwidth control that I typically have over an electric motor to replicate anything that I would want my muscle to act like. There's one big exception, it's something we've never had with electric motors, is uh, the ability to heal. Okay, so if you break your electric motor, you're dead. If you, uh, you know, whatever, but it, I mean, I think a completely different type of actuation. For me, the biggest selling point is if it has some ability to be more robust to, to minor tears that were already just to, to, if you lose a few muscle fibers, your muscle's still in okay shape. Maybe we do all the time. Um, and, uh, but it, especially if you can have something that's kind of uh, repairing itself, that is next level. I hope I didn't offend anybody who works on artificial muscles. I, I, I think, uh, good. Okay, so let me say a few words sort of about um, what we've done here. So we covered a lot of ground in the class, right? So uh, just to remind you, we sort of started with just describing robots, right? What, what are the arms out there? What are the hands out there? Why should you care about having a torque controlled robot? We went through pick and place, right, which is the very basic kinematics and uh, trajectory planning, but manual trajectory planning. Then we introduced the basic elements of perception. You remember all of our pose estimation, iterative closest point, its variance, right? And that's a very strong pipeline um, when you have known objects and sufficient views of the object. We did bin picking as sort of our first end-to-end -end application where you had to program sort of the task level complexity of the, of the robot, right, as well as choosing grasps and doing all these things. And then to, make, to get better, we did motion planning, trajectory optimization, sample-based motion planning. We talked a little bit about mobile manipulation, about more higher level control Right, our, our stiffness controller, our force controller, the deep learning view of perception, right, and a little bit of RL. And I started, just barely started some notes on, so on some of the soft robot stuff uh, at the end here, okay? So that's a lot of area, a lot of surface area that we covered. Uh, <clears throat> so let's step back and, you know, so uh, Bo Yuan gave a lecture on Tuesday about foundation models, right? This stuff's coming, so how much of this is still relevant? I would say a couple things. So first of all, um, I think the, the behavior cloning things that I have seen are um, incredibly good at a lot of tasks and are bringing together this, like what I've been calling common sense robustness in a way that we've never had before. But their success rate on any one task is still pretty low it's a new technology, right? I mean, 80% or something like this, let's say. So you ha we haven't seen either RL, I mean, RL in quadrupeds is starting to get out of the lab and into the world, but RL in manipulation I haven't seen deployed in any production system. I would say, and I'd actually be interested if that changes, I should think if I've seen anything recently that changed, but I would say that we really haven't seen that get out of the lab yet. Okay, so most most companies that are doing manipulation and pushing the frontiers of like, you know, from flexible warehouse manipulation, maybe food services and, and these things, they are still using mostly a, a, more, a slightly more classical perception, state estimation, motion planning, force control pipeline. Okay. And I think it's a very different thing that's starting to come online with these foundation models um, for and, and learning-based controllers. Both are good. I would also say that the best controllers that you're seeing demonstrated from learning-based control have a very solid foundation in force control and operations-based control, sometimes motion planning. You know, you're not sending raw torques to, raw, raw currents to motors. You're building on the foundation that we've developed over the course of the class, right? The perception tends to go more from RGB, okay? The, the geometric perception is not, I mean, knowing, I mean, you use that stuff to like calibrate your cameras and things like this, but, but actually in the, 
closed loop, we don't see as much ge geometric perception as we used to. Okay, so it's a pretty awesome time. Um, the foundation models are definitely coming. I think we don't really know how this is gonna change things, right? Um, we don't know what are the total implications of having, uh, let me say, an intelligence that understands the physics of manipulation, right? If you're willing to call it that. Uh, and we don't know how soon it's gonna be ready for production, how it's gonna change the way we build our other controllers. So this is like, this is kind of the moment for the field, for like right on this edge of like maybe something totally different's about to happen. Uh, it's a good time, it's a good time. Okay, I said, before most of you were here, I said a lot about logistics for next week. Um, I'll post it also on Piazza, okay? Uh, and so on Tuesday, I get to watch you present, and I'll see you then. And I'm gonna run over to the TRI diffusion policy talk in CSAIL uh, for four o'clock. Okay, see you guys.